Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, one of the directions that uh, my lab has been going in in the past decade or so, uh, zane spectroscopy to look specifically at marine systems and the reactivity of halide salts, which were previously assumed to be unreactive in marine systems. So I want to emphasize here that um, my research group is composed entirely of undergraduates. Almost all of them are female. And I have had the privilege over the years to bring quite a few female undergraduates to the synchrotron. Specifically, we go to uh, the National Synchrotron Light Source at Brookhaven National Lab. Um, we went to NSLS1 many, many times over the years. We had our first theme time that was supposed to happen in March at uh, NSLS2, and I had a uh, all of these ladies ready to go, this one and this one right here. But unfortunately, COVID derailed those plans. So we're hoping to get back in the future. Um, so I want to talk to you today about seawater. Now, seawater, being an English lit nerd, I have to quote Coleridge and say, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Of course, he was talking about seawater, which, although it's mostly water, is 3.5% salts by mass, rendering it not potable. So what that means is if we break down the, the salt composition, uh, we have quite a few cations and anions that are dissolved in seawater, and by far the most abundant ion in seawater is chloride beating its nearest competitor, sodium, by almost 15% by mass. So there is a lot of chloride dissolved in seawater. We have other anions like sulfate. Uh, then we have major cations, calcium, potassium, and magnesium. And then minor constituents include the other halides along with a host of other uh, dissolved ions. So if we look at different elements in the ocean, this is the classic Nozaki vertical profiles of elements in the North Pacific. It's a really interesting periodic table that shows the concentrations of different elements with depth in the North Pacific Ocean. So if we look at these elemental profiles, right away we can zoom in on the limiting nutrients. Phosphorus, silicon, what else? Iron. These are elements that are completely depleted in the surface waters. Zinc, nitrogen, of course. Completely depleted in the surface waters and then their concentrations increase. So these are elements that are said to be very bioactive in seawater. We also have elements that are only partially depleted in surface waters. Uh, carbon is a great example of that. Car carbonic acid or bicarbonate in seawater is partially depleted in the surface waters. And then we have elements that don't show any redox activity down the water column at all. Of course, we have the, the alkali metals, uh, we have some of the alkaline earth metal cations, and then we have the halides. So fluoride, fluoride, and bromide notably don't show any kind of redox activity down the water column sulfur as sulfate as well uh, is unreactive if we look at its behavior in seawater. So zooming in on those halogens, we can really see how there's this paradigm of their unreactivity in seawater. Fluoride, chloride, bromide are all showing just a, a straight line going down the seawater column. Depth is on this y-axis here. I, iodine has some interesting redox activity because it's the least electronegative of the bunch, but very low concentration. These are a couple of hundred nanomolar concentrations. Whereas chloride being the most abundant element in seawater, we're looking at uh, about more than 500 millimolar concentration. And bromine comes in at just under a millimolar. So the reason for their reactivity, of course, is their electron affinity. Halogens have the highest electron affinity of any elements in the periodic table. Chlorine, of course, takes the cake with the highest electron affinity of all. So these elements really want to grab onto that extra electron, become the negatively charged halides, and kind of never let that go. Um, so when we look at the ocean, generally we think of halogens as being dissolved salts, halide salts. Uh, 0.5 molar chloride and about one millimolar bromide. However, we also know that there are organohalogens in the ocean, and there's been a lot of research on the anthropogenic organohalogens in the ocean. So these are generally man-made pollutants like dioxins, 
uh, which are organochlorines that are known to be byproducts of pulp and paper processing, uh, pulp and paper creation and pulp and paper mills. PBDEs, so polybrominated diphenyl ethers are, are flame retardants and because of fire regulations, they're put in pretty much everything from carpets to furniture. So these kinds of compounds uh, are known to be in marine ecosystems. They are uh, generally lipid soluble, so they bioaccumulate up the food chain. They are persistent and many of them are very toxic and carcinogenic as well. So these anthropogenic compounds and others like them are known to kind of uh, enter marine ecosystems. Uh, however, we also have natural products in which carbon and bromine are bonded to each other. So brominated natural products abound in marine ecosystems and they, they take all different kinds of forms. There are bromophenols, bromopyrroles, bromoindoles, uh, all kinds of different aliphatic organobromine compounds. And they're generally produced by organisms that don't have fins to swim away. For example, sponges, seaweeds, also known as macroalgae. These kind of organisms need some pretty potent chemical defense weapons in their arsenal. So it's thought that the brominated natural products that they produce are part of those chemical weapons. Generally, they use an enzyme called bromoperoxidase or BPO to produce brominated natural products. And there you just, well, what the enzyme does is it uses hydrogen peroxide to oxidize bromide to a reactive brominating species that then goes on to kind of indiscriminately halogenate electron-rich organic substrates to make organobromine compounds. Uh, it's a really interesting enzyme. Uh, lots of BPO enzymes are actually vanadium-based enzymes, so um, organisms are known to use those to make brominated natural products. As for chlorinated natural products, you guys saw that the electron affinity of chlorine is higher than for bromine. So there's been an assumed redox threshold. Why would organisms oxidize chloride in seawater when bromide is so abundant? Bromoperoxidase uh, actually cannot oxidize chloride. So haloperoxidases are generally named after the most electronegative halogen that they can oxidize. So uh, bromoperoxidases are uh, incapable of oxidizing chloride. So in addition to salts, of course, the ocean teems with life. And I want to talk about uh, the life in the oceans because that's really what this talk is going to be about. So in the euphotic zone of seawater, the euphotic zone is the zone where light can penetrate and it varies. Its depth can go down to about 100 meters depending on the turbidity of the water. Phytoplankton, also known as marine microalgae, are photosynthetic organisms that live in that euphotic zone, and they are the source of most of the uh, marine organic matter in the oceans. Now, when these phytoplankton die, their rotting carcasses start falling down the water column, and they start to be chemically transformed through both biological and abiotic mechanisms. And in that process, the vast majority, 99%, of the organic carbon gets recycled back to CO2 and then it goes back up to the surface waters and just kind of enters the carbon cycle. However, a very small fraction, about on the order of 1% of the organic matter, makes its way to the sediments. And we care about that because that's a carbon sink, because originally that carbon was CO2 in the atmosphere that these photosynthesizers fixed. So it's interesting to consider how trace elements or even not so trace elements like halogens might interact with the organic matter and stabilize it and or destabilize it with respect to burial in the sediments. So talking about bromine and its interactions with carbon, uh, bromine zanes is a really interesting way to kind of get at that problem. So I just want to introduce you to what uh, bromine K-edge zane spectra look like for different model compounds. And here I'm showing you a bunch of different spectra, kind of zooming in right at the near edge. So here we have the um, uh, K-edge of bromine around 13.474 uh, KeV. And there we have the transitions of the 1s electron of bromine up to empty atomic and molecular orbitals. So here I have an inorganic bromide that's dissolved in water, and you can see it has this very broad transition. That's just Br minus floating around. 
now we have different organobromine standards where carbon is bonded to bromine. So we have dibromobenzene, bromophenol, and then these two aliphatic compounds, bromoadamantane and tert-butylbromide. These compounds have spectra with this discrete low energy feature. And that feature comes from the 1s electron being promoted up to sigma star and pi star molecular orbitals. So you only see this when you have a carbon bromine covalent bond. What's more, here I'm running these two lines vertically through characteristic uh, white lines of aliphatic organobromine and aromatic organobromine. So you can see for these two aliphatic organobromines, uh, this transition occurs almost one electron volt lower in energy than the feature for the aromatic compounds when we have aromatic carbon bromine bonds. And that's because we have different bond lengths for aromatic and aliphatic organobromine compounds. And the aromatic organobromine actually has partial pi character in the carbon bromine bond that shortens the bond and uh, makes that energy occur at a slightly, makes that transition occur at a slightly higher energy. So many years ago, with my advisor to teach my nanny at Princeton, my PhD advisor, who I think is here today, uh, we were working on a project looking at sediments from all over the globe. And we looked, we used bromine zanes to look at estuarine sediments in Cape Cod, for instance. And we looked at sediments going down an almost 25 centimeter uh, sediment core. And what you can see is that the surface sediments have that little organobromine feature very clearly delineated here. And as you go down the sediment core in depth, you see that little feature become a shoulder and then eventually almost shrink away entirely. And we saw that in, in a lot of different places where we have a lot of organobromine at the surface and then it seems to be debrominated going down the sedimentary column. What's more, if we compare the organobromine with organic carbon, in general, we see a correlation between the total amount of organobromine and the total amount of organic carbon. So this is just uh, the data from, from here. We're able to speciate organic and inorganic forms of bromine using a linear combination fitting of the Zane spectra. So we can actually tell how much organobromine there is. Uh, so we did that in this, uh, in this project from many years ago for many different locations, the Antarctic Pacific, Southern Ocean, and two locations in the Bering Sea. And these data are not particularly important, but what we saw was that organobromine is ubiquitous. It is all over the globe in the sediments. In general, but not always, it decreases as a function of depth in the sediments. And there's a pretty good correlation between organobromine and organic carbon. So this begs the question, where is all of this organobromine coming from? So in order to do that, uh, with Bruce, who I think is here today, a couple of years ago at his old beamline X23A2 at the first NSLS, uh, we wanted to develop a Zanes-based method to quantify bromine. And the, the reason for this is that I always, you know, we're, we're always doing these Zane spectra and we're really interested in what's, hap in what's happening in the near edge region because that sheds light on the coordination environment of your element of interest and its oxidation state. However, in a Zane's experiment, you also have what we call the edge step. These are different unnormalized Zane spectra of standards of uh, potassium bromide. So these are different concentrations of bromide that's homogenized in a very soft organic matter matrix of polyacrylate. And the pre-edge is subtracted here, but these are unnormalized edge steps. So when you go out very far in energy after all of the near edge um, features have attenuated, you can take the difference between the post edge and the pre-edge as a quantitative indicator of how much of your element interest you have, provided you have samples of uh, uniform density and thickness. Um, you can see here that the greater the concentration of bromide in our sample, the greater the edge step. And we see a very linear dependence of the edge step taken as the difference between the post edge and the pre-edge 
and the bromine concentration in the samples with a, a very nice correlation. So we were able to show that bromine concentrations scale linearly with absolute bromine fluorescence intensity, which should surprise no one, except that it's kind of useful because you can simultaneously, if your samples are prepared correctly, you can get quantitative and uh, speciation concentration. Now, what was unique about what we did was we were able to consider sample thickness as an important factor in quantifying bromine using zanes, because you can make your standards any thickness you want, right? But quite often, especially when you're dealing with natural samples, uh, I was coming into a situation where I had underweight samples. And for hard x-rays like 13 keV, you have x-rays that penetrate an organic sample completely. That penetration is a useful property. You can mount an energy calibration standard behind it and kind of get your energy calibrated uh, every single moment of your experiment. We're measuring fluorescence here. And what we wanted to do was see if we could develop a, a correction factor, an empirical correction factor to account for sample thickness. So here, these are all standards with 300 parts per million bromine, but they have different thicknesses. So here are just the different masses of the samples. The mass and the thickness are, are correlated. And you can see that the, the less thick the sample, the, the lower the edge step. However, it's not a linear relationship. As the sample thickness increases, the edge step follows this exponential. And that's a very well-known relationship where the X-ray signal is attenuated both when the X-ray beam is entering the sample uh, and when it's coming out on its way to the fluorescence detector, you have quite a bit of absorption by the sample matrix. So this, uh, we were able to actually generate empirically this exponential so that we could figure out what these factors are from our data over here. And these go into this equation and that enabled us to generate a correction factor. So if we had an underweight sample with mass M1, uh, we could generate this correction factor so that we could relate it to the calibration standards, which have a mass of M0. So this is really useful because it will enable us to simultaneously quantify and speciate bromine in organic matter samples. Um, all right, so I would like to talk about, maybe I'll stop there for questions in case anybody has a, a question before moving on. Yeah, there's a few questions. That's, um, uh, that's, that's a great introduction. Thank you. Um, one question, uh, going back to that wonderful figure with the periodic table. Um, are you still there, Alessandra? Oh, no. Did I stop my screen sharing? Yeah, you stopped sharing. Okay. So you should. Uh, that's all right. We'll wait. All okay. right. Yeah, you got it. Um, we don't have your present. There you go. Now we're back. Okay. That great figure with the periodic table. Uh, the question was um, that the oxygen with depth looked pretty interesting. And if you could comment on that. Okay. So let's see. The oxygen with depth looks pretty interesting. Right. So you have lots of oxygen in the surface waters because the, the source of the oxygen is the atmosphere. Oops. I mean to do that. The source of the oxygen is the atmosphere, so we have it quite enriched in the surface waters. And then it is going to get depleted as organisms are using it. And then as we have the oxidative processes kind of going on, we have it being released as a part of the, uh, I guess, oxygen cycle going down the water column. But the source of it is air, right? 18% of air is oxygen, so that's why it's so enriched in the surface waters. Okay, and just to clarify here, the oxygen we're talking about is dissolved O2, yes? Yes. Okay, yes. and that figure is dissolved O2. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, another you can see that. What? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, are you there, Alessandra? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, I thought I interrupted you. Um, uh, another question is, uh, what's the matrix for the quantization uh, study? And is it seawater or is it the sediment themselves? For the standards? Uh, no, I th uh, Matthew, do you want to ask your question directly? Yeah, it's a, yeah so you're, you're quantifying uh, bromine, but bromine in what? 
So is it mm -hmm. a, some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of organic uh, material or, or what? Yeah, great question. So here we're using zines to quantify bromine in standards. And these are, this is aqueous bromide that is homogenized in a matrix of polyacrylate. And the reason we use that soft organic matrix is because in a few minutes, I'm going to show you how we use this procedure to quantify bromine and phytoplankton. So we needed a soft organic matrix that had similar properties as phytoplankton. So polyacrylate is just a, a polymer. Uh, it's mainly like, it's kind of similar in elemental composition to uh, what phytoplankton, what any kind of biomass would be. So we wanted to ensure that the standards and the samples have similar X-ray absorption properties. Just right, like you would in any XRF experiment. Not. Yeah. Okay, and I had a question, just whether you knew if there had been um, uh, much X-ray emission spectroscopy work at all on bromine? Um, well, we, we did, I, I don't really know. We did some XRF quantification work for this previous study. So that was all done using, you know, the emission spectra and the, the signal from those emission spectra. But uh, I'm not sure outside of that if there's been a lot of XES studies on bromine. And in the chat, it was pointed out that there has been some herfty. Yeah, we wanted to do, Bruce and I wanted to do that a while ago to improve the uh, resolution because sure. you have the core hole broadening problems here, mm -hmm. which you can actually see in the standards. Right. So, you know, this is not too terrific a signal. And if you compare that with tender energies like chlorine, here, I'll show you just really quick later in the talk, I'm gonna talk about this, but I might uh -huh. as well talk about it now. Um, what the organochlorine spectra look like is much nicer. Uh, here, I'll just show you an example of a chlorine spectrum. Here's chlorine and you can see how that, that pre-edge feature basically, that, that white line feature yeah. for the yeah. carbon chlorine bond is so much better resolved because you don't have the core hole broadening issue mm -hmm. as much. So uh, yeah, it would be awesome to do some mm -hmm. high energy resolution zanes on these and improve the resolution. It, it would probably improve our fits. Uh -huh. so we have pretty substantial errors in our linear combination fitting. Mm -hmm. What about L-edge um, uh, down at what's that, around one and a half kilovolts? Um, uh, could the, could these, some of these studies done with samples in vacuum or else encased so they could go in vacuum? Or is that an edge where you're not going to be probing the right density of states at the Fermi level? Uh, I think it's been done. I haven't done any L-edge work, but I know that Satish, I think, has done some bromine L-edge studies, if I'm not mistaken. Satish, so, would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, great introduction, Alice. Uh, yeah, I was trying to be in two so, uh, yeah, we, we tried uh, some bromine L-edge, uh, and it's actually very well resolved. But I think uh, we can do samples that have very high concentration, and going down to these natural samples is harder. So, but it is, yeah, it has much better resolution compared to the chaos experiment. I see. Okay. All right. We should let you con continue, Alessandra. Thank you. All right. So let's see. Where was I? I think I was going back to the geochemistry part here. So I'll get rid of this. Um, right. So going back to seawater and what's going on in seawater we wanted to see if we could trace the source of the organobromine that had been discovered ubiquitously all over the globe in marine sediments. And to figure out where it's coming from in the sediments, we have to go to the source of organic matter in the sediments, which is phytoplankton primarily, also known as marine microalgae. So these are the major photosynthesizers in the surface waters again. And we wanted to see if those phytoplankton are producing organobromines A, and if after they die and their organic matter starts to be decomposed, uh, which releases oxygen, there goes to the question of the oxygen increasing as we go down the water column, it's mainly that decomposition that's releasing it. Um, we wanted to see if anything in the phyto phytoplankton actually gets brominated during these oxidation processes en route to the sediment, kind of. So, Phytoplankton contains lots of lipids 
and proteins. So here I'm just showing you an unsaturated uh, lipid, and here is tyrosine, which is an amino acid, one of the aromatic amino acid residues. So could some of the phytoplankton's biomolecules be targets for electrophilic bromination going down the water column? That really was a question we wanted to ask. So uh, to answer that question, this is work that I did with Larry Meyer at the University of Maine and uh, Kathleen Thornton at Bruce's old beam line at NSLS, X23A2. So here we're looking at different algae that we acquired because they're common algae, mainly these are not macroalgae, but microalgae, so unicellular uh, phytoplankton. These are acquired from different aquaculture suppliers. And we looked at tetracelmus, nanochloroxis, and these two other genera, phyodactylum and peplova. Here I'm just showing you some organobromine standards so you can remember what the Zane spectra look like in the near edge region. So we decided to lyse the cells to isolate what we call the membranes. And the reason we were going after the membranes was to kind of isolate the lipids and proteins that probably constitute the biomass that is kind of settling down the water column. And using the bromine zanes, we were able to speciate aliphatic and aromatic forms of organobromine and inorganic bromide. So let's look at tetracelmus. Look at how messy this spectrum is. It's very low concentration of total bromine, about four parts per million, and that's the whole cell, evenly split between organic and inorganic forms. When we lyse the cell, we are, by the way, I should mention, everything we're doing has undergone the most heinous set of rinsing with deionized water you can imagine to remove bromide from the signal because we're doing all of our experiments in seawater. So before anything goes under the beam, it gets, it gets, uh, it gets itself rinsed quite thoroughly. I'd be happy to talk to anyone about those procedures. Um, so when we lyse the cells after rinsing, we're able to get rid of all the inorganic bromide. So we just have this, these very small quantities of organobromine in the untreated tetracelmus membranes. Nanochloropsis is another green alga like tetracelmus. It has not very much bromine, but whatever it does have is organic. We couldn't lyse the cells for that one, so it wasn't an ideal substrate for us to use anyway. We lysed cells of phaeodactylum and peplopha, these two other genera, and we found a completely different situation. Tons of organobromine in their, in their membranes, particularly in the peplopha. And in phaeodactylum, more or aromatic organobromine than aliphatic and the opposite in pavlova, more aliphatic than aromatic. So basically what this is showing is that some phytoplankton are actually producing quite a bit of organobromine themselves. So this biosynthetic organobromine in the, in the particulate phytoplankton is one potential source of the organobromine that makes it into the marine sediments. However, the tetracelmus detritus, those uh, untreated membranes, because they have so little bromine to begin with, they are the perfect substrate to test our alternative hypothesis that these algal membranes can be brominated as the uh, organic matter is transformed down the water column. So to test that hypothesis, we designed a couple of treatments taking that detritus, so that, that lysed, those lysed cell membranes, and subjecting them to different oxidative treatments, kind of like what they would be subjected to in seawater. So using hydrogen peroxide, which is ubiquitous in seawater, byproducts of photosynthesis, and in combination with uh, bromoperoxidase enzyme, without the enzyme, uh, two different concentrations of hydrogen peroxide, what we found is that over the course of a three-week experiment, we have lots of organobromine being formed in those phytoplankton membranes compared with the control. Okay, so this, this lower one is the control here. And when we have even just a two millimolar H2O2, we have a lot of organobromine being formed with 20 millimolar even more. And then with the BPO, the bromoperoxidase, we have quite a bit forming and then boom, it drops off. Speciating it into aliphatic and aromatic forms of organobromine, we can see these axes are the same. We can see that most of the organobromine formed is actually aliphatic, interestingly. And it seems to drop off. So in the most 
oxygenating treatment, we're forming this stuff, but eventually we're also knocking off the bromine atoms as well. So that shows that we can definitely form these things through these kind of peroxidative reactions. We also tested some other abiotic reactions, these photofensin-like treatments of tetracelmids. The fentanyl reaction is uh, a reaction that's pretty well known in um, oxidative chemistry where we have the iron catalyzed disproportionation of hydrogen peroxide to produce uh, hydroxyl radicals. And it can have halogenation as one of its side effects. So we use catalytic quantities of iron II in combination with small concentrations of hydrogen peroxide and we irradiated it to do this kind of photo Fenton reaction. And then we had a number of controls where we were just irradiated and we just did Fenton chemistry in the dark and then no treatment. So you can see the results of that over the course of the three week experiment. All of these treatments produced organobromine in the samples compared with the control. The most effective by far was the photo Fenton treatment followed by just the light by itself and then the dark Fenton treatment here. Uh, we have a split once again between aliphatic and aromatic forms of organobromine being made. Um, we have really both of them being made by all of the treatments. So because you're all x-ray spectroscopists, I'm going to show you the unnormalized spectra because it's more fun than just the, the numbers themselves. Here are unnormalized spectra. So they're um, background subtracted but unnormalized spectra of the photo Fenton treated samples at different days in the treatment. So uh, these are again catalytic amounts of iron II, hydrogen peroxide, and light. After one day we have a little bit of organobromine and you can see after two and three weeks this carbon bromine feature is so well resolved. I mean it looks like a standard. Actually it looks better than many of our standards. Um, so we have quite a bit of organobromine being formed and then of course the edge step is proportional to the amount of bromine being formed because these samples are all um, made in exactly the same way with the same density and thickness. Now if we look at all of the samples of the different treatments from two weeks along in the experiment, you can kind of use that relative edge step to see which, which treatment was the most effective in brominating. And the one with the highest edge step by far is the uh, bromoperoxidase catalyzed one. So biology wins here. However, that photofentin abiotic reaction, which is a pretty decent model of something that might happen in um, in, in surface waters, you know, if, if, if sped up a little bit with this concentration just to happen on the timescale of a couple of weeks, uh, we have this, a, these abiotic reactions coming in as sec, close seconds. All right, so how can we compare this with, with what's happening in nature? We were lucky to have access to some sediment trap samples. So we have particulate detritus from sediment traps. Uh, basically you suspend these conical sample collection vials and they catch marine snow sinking down the water column. And we got some samples from a cruise off the coast of Oman in the Arabian Sea. It's a really biologically productive um, region. These samples were from really deep in the water column, so uh, almost a kilometer or several kilometers down the water column. And here I'm showing you a comparison of our experimental models with the sediment trap material. I'm zooming in very, very close on the near edge of bromine here because I want to emphasize the position of the absorption maximum. Here are spectra of the treated phytoplankton membrane. So we just took this very nice fresh uh, phytoplankton membranes and subjected them to different treatments. And you'll recall that we produced both aliphatic and aromatic organobromine in that instance. You can see that here because this absorption maximum is in between the characteristic maxima of aliphatic and aromatic organobromine standards. However, looking at nature, the Arabian Sea sediment trap material from a kilometer or so down the water column, very different story. I'm showing you a representative spectrum. We took 20, 25 spectra of different uh, Arabian Sea sediment trap samples. They all looked identical and they were all entirely aromatic organobromine. You can see how this white line lines up with that of the parabromophenol standard. So what we saw in nature is very different to what we saw in our experimental models in the sense that the aliphatic organobromine is not there at all. So just to summarize, 
uh, bromide is susceptible to biological uh, transformation to organic forms of uh, to, to organobromine compounds, both aliphatic and aromatic organobromine compounds. However, we also have abiotic reactions that can transform it as well. So we think that's happening in the euphotic zone. And then when this, along with all the rest of the organic matter, sinks down the water column and degrades, only the aromatic organobromine persists. So clearly we have in phytoplankton aliphatic organobromine, but it's labile it's susceptible to degradation along with uh, most of the rest of the organic matter. However, the aromatic organobromine that forms seems to be a relatively stable form of carbon. Uh, so aromatic organobromine might be something that is, is interesting in terms of uh, stabilizing carbon. All right, I just wanna talk briefly about uh, chlorine. So in seawater, we have about 500 millimolar chloride and it's thought to be unreactive because unlike bromine, it's, it's more electronegative and we don't have bromoperoxidase. Uh, bromoperoxidase is incapable of oxidizing it. So using the same kind of Zanes-based approach, I'm showing you uh, chlorine Zanes of different inorganic and organochlorine compounds. And compared with the inorganic chloride spectrum shown here, these organochlorine Zane spectra have this very well-resolved distinct low energy feature. Um, once again, we have the aliphatic organobromine absorption maximum occurring about 0.6 electron volts lower in energy than the aromatic organochlorine maximum. And uh, the reason for that is that the aromatic organochlorine actually has some partial pi characters. So this is really old DFT based cartoons from when I was a grad student. And you can see that uh, most of the transition for these transitions here come from the 1s to sigma star interaction. So this is clearly a sigma star interaction along the bonding axis. However, there's a very small contributor for aromatic uh, carbon chlorine bonds of uh, the 1s to pi star transition where we have the 3p orbital on chlorine interacting with the entire conjugated pi system of the aromatic ring. So that's what breaks this bond up a little bit in energy. Now, let's look at those Arabian sea particulates from the sediment traps. For chlorine, here are the standards for reference. The sediment trap samples, uh, the, I'm just showing you a bunch of representative ones from different depths in the water column. Those sediment trap samples, interestingly, have their absorption maximum intermediate between the aliphatic and aromatic uh, absorption maxima, suggesting that there's a mixture of both. So we analyzed a lot of samples and we didn't find any rhyme or reason to the amounts, the relative quantities of aromatic and aliphatic organochlorine as a function of depth in the water column because we had samples from a bunch of different depths. The only thing we found really that was consistent is that in general, there's more aliphatic organochlorine than aromatic fascinating because it's the exact opposite of what we found with the organobromines, where in, our, in these same samples, there's only aromatic organobromine and no trace of the aliphatic. So these aliphatic organochlorines are relatively stable compared with their organobromine counterparts. All right, so we were lucky at the very end of NSLS to be able to use the test beam line when um, the mini hutch was undergoing commissioning at X15B, which is Paul Northrup's old beam line at NSLS-1. And we mapped chlorine distribution in those Arabian Sea particulates. Here I'm showing you a sample from almost two kilometers down the water column. This is the scale, just for your reference, so we have these kind of particulates, this marine snow. And we were able to uh, focus the beam down to a very small spot size and collect microzane spectra at different points on this map. So here I'm, I'm showing you the hot spots where we collected the microzane spectra and then I've kind of color coded the microzane spectra so you can see where these spectra originate from with respect to this map. Now, in the bulk, we saw a mixture of aliphatic and ar aromatic organobromine which we could quantify by linear combinations. In the uh, X-ray spectrum microscopy results, we see 
very few and far between, but very intense and very clean microzane spectra that were aliphatic. Compared with much more frequent, but messier, lower concentration spectra that are aromatic. You can see how their absorption maximum lines up with that of the aromatic standard. So this is showing that there are indeed two fractions of organochlorine in these Arabian Sea particulates, this aliphatic fraction and the aromatic fraction. So we wanted to see if we could correlate their, uh, at least see if there was any coincidence in the occurrence of these hotspots with any other biologically relevant elements. So we looked at calcium, which of course, uh, there are a lot of coccolithophores and foraminifera and that kind of thing in these sediments. And then uh, silicon, would be, which would be representative of diatoms. So here I'm showing you again those chlorine hotspots. This is the aliphatic hotspot in red, and the rest are all aromatic hotspots. And what you can see right away is that with silicon, there's no coincidence at all of the organochlorine hotspots with silicon. And with calcium, there's no coincidence with the aromatic hotspots. However, this organochlorine, aliphatic organochlorine hotspot is adjacent to a calcium hotspot. That's interesting because we also looked at fresh phytoplankton. Now, we looked at the, some of the species that I showed you before, Paplopha, Phyodactylum, and Tetraselmus, but we also looked at E. huxleyi. E. huxleyi is, of course, the model coccolithophore. It's a calcium carbonate-based uh, organism, and we were not able to rinse it very well because of the kind of protection that that calcium carbonate affords. So that's why this spectrum has a lot of residual inorganic chloride in it. However, there is a sizable component of aliphatic organochlorine in that E. huxleyi. So E. huxleyi and coccolithophores like it. These are calcium bearing organisms. Given this, and we saw this kind of coincidence of the aliphatic organochlorine with the calcium in several different samples, we really need to get back to the TES beam line to, to, ver to substantiate the idea that this aliphatic organochlorine is something that these E. hux are producing. And it's also something that appears to be pretty stable going down the water column. All right, so I'll stop there uh, to take a couple of questions. That's great. Um, the uh, Remind me, and I'm sorry, you probably said this and it just didn't sink in. Um, when you see uh, aromatic versus uh, aliphatic, what is, what is that telling you about the, the, the mechanism by which the organochlorine was, or organochloride was formed? Right, so we see that here, I'll sh actually, maybe I can show you here. Yeah, that was my next slide, actually. Oh, sorry. So, no, it's a great, it's a great segue. So here, here we did these kind of similar mechanistic study of the phytoplankton in tetrasalmus membranes. And I'm showing you unnormalized spectra once again, fenton-like reactions, photofenton-like reactions, and then just like sunlight irradiating these things. And all of these are, very interestingly able to produce organochlorine. Now, when we speciate it, aliphatic versus aromatic, we're finding that most of these abiotic reactions are producing more aliphatic than aromatic organochlorine. So, you know, mechanistically, it's hard to say. We have both biological and abiotic mechanisms producing both aliphatic and aromatic organochlorines and organobromines. Um, with the organobromines, we see the, the BPO, the biological, the enzyme producing more uh, aliphatic than aromatic. However, they're all kind of producing both. So it's kind of hard to say, unfortunately, what okay. the mechanisms are. I think that because they're just electrophilic forms of bromine probably reacting with electron-rich substrates that um, both aliphatic and aromatic organic substrates are susceptible to electrophilic bromination. So I know that's kind of a lame non-answer to the question, but basically we're seeing both the biosynthetic forms of organochlorine and the abiotic ones that are contributing to this chlorinated organic detritus that is pretty stable en route to the sediments. Um, and the reason this is important is because 
really I, chloride has been presumed to be unreactive for so long because it's just not susceptible to oxidation by bromoperoxidase. But clearly there is some interesting redox chemistry of chlorine in seawater. Okay. okay. I can answer more questions. It's okay. I was going to yeah. say, why don't you, why don't you, um, uh, why don't you continue? And we have some more questions we'll ask at the end. Okay, I just have a fun thing to kind of wrap up with. Okay, great. Uh, this, this, this won't take long. Um, so we basically, all of that work with the phytoplankton was real like global cycle work. And what, what I'm doing now in collaboration with Ina Liu at Texas A&M is we're trying to um, see how chlorination and bromination stabilize or destabilize carbon. However, that's for another time. I want to talk about something fun. Uh, people around the world eat seaweed, and it's touted among, in the U.S., it's touted in the uh, naturopath community for all of these different health benefits, preventing goiter, because it contains a lot of iodide, boosting bone health, has a lot of calcium, and then all of these kind of anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, antibacterial, even antiviral properties. Um, and it's used in a lot of different kind of cuisines. So one fun thing that we did recently was look at uh, the concentrations of organobromine and organochlorine in edible seaweeds. So the edible seaweeds that we looked at were all brown seaweeds. These are different kelps, sweet kelp, something called bladder rack. We got these from Scotland, Atlantic kelp. Uh, wakame actually is a, a Hawaiian sample. And the sea sprigs is uh, also from, from Scotland. And what we see, we rinsed these quite a bit, but what we see is definitely very sharp organobromine features in all of them. Not very surprising. Seaweeds are known to make a lot of organobromines. However, we have very high concentrations, particularly of aromatic organobromines on the order of several hundred parts per million. And aliphatic is um, lower than that, but still present. So this is interesting because, you know, before this, people had isolated different organobromine compounds from seaweeds, but this is showing the total concentrations of them. Um, if you look at just the XRF spectrum of seaweeds, here's a four out of the five of those seaweeds I just showed you, the bromine peak is enormous. And of course, you can't really compare these directly, but um, it, the magnitude of the organically bound bromine is greater than any other heavy element. It's probably on the same order as calcium. So the, there's a lot of bromine in these seaweeds, and when we eat when we eat them, we're consuming a lot of organically bound bromine. Now, this was perhaps more surprising. We looked at the chlorine zanes of these same kelps, and we found very stark organochlorine features in all but one of them. And quantifying the amount of organochlorine, we see lots of aliphatic organochlorine as well as aromatic. So once again, we have like this greater diversity of aliphatic organochlorines, or at least a greater concentration of aliphatic organochlorines than aliphatic organobromines, just like we saw with microalgae. So this was a surprise because there is quite a bit of organochlorine in, in the seaweeds. Uh, using FTIR, this is a, just a part of the region of the FTIR spectrum, we were able to use this alkene CH uh, vibration in the FTIR spectrum to calculate an unsaturation index for the different seaweeds. And we found a correlation between organochlorine and unsaturated um, carbon. So presumably we're looking largely, when we're looking at this aliphatic organochlorine, we're looking largely at chlorinated lipids. So we think that might be a possible uh, formation pathway, chlorination of lipids. So what does this mean? When we eat a nice seafood salad, we're consuming along with it several hundred parts per million of uh, both organochlorine and organobromine. And for this paper in food chemistry, we did a quick back of the envelope calculation using those numbers. And we found that uh, we, you know, we took the midpoint of the measured ranges. It, for somebody who eats seaweed in a seaweed eating culture, an eight gram per day consumption is uh, a reasonable assumption. And for a 65 kilogram adult, your daily organochlorine consumption would be 46 microgram per kilogram of body weight, daily organobromine 31 micrograms per kilograms of body weight. And we found that this is 11,000 times greater than the recommended exposure dose of PBDEs, so 2.75 nanogram per kilogram body weight of PBDE, anthropogenic uh, polybrominated diphenyl ether pollutants. 
So that was kind of a fun project that I did with a couple of students. So I would like to end by acknowledging uh, the students who worked on the projects, primarily Maritza Donegan, Rosie Wenrick, Katie Ness, Austin Gellis, um, my collaborators, Beamline scientists, Bruce, Kors, Paul, Larry and Kathleen at the University of Maine, Cindy Lee uh, was so generous in giving us those Arabian Sea sediment trap samples. And uh, that's it. So I'm happy to take any, any questions. Thank you. That was, uh, that was terrific. Um, let me ask a, a kind of a, a question to bring you back to one of your big pictures. Uh, you talked about the carbon cycle and that needing to understand the chemistry that happens involving the, uh, the halogens uh, could make people change uh, their understanding of some aspect of the carbon cycle uh, down at sedimentation. Uh, do you think that that's, uh, that that's likely to happen? I do, and that's what we want to do. That's what we're working on. Um, so one thing that I think is really fascinating, and you know, we have several different hypotheses around this. I don't know what's the best way to go back to this. Maybe here. Um, so we are brominating organic matter, right, through all these different mechanisms. And everybody thinks about organohalogens as being persistent because halogens basically enshroud carbon backbones in electron density and it makes it hard to break them down, right? So there's this idea that, you know, these naturally produced organohalogens should be a relatively stable form of carbon. And we see that in certain fractions. The aromatic organobromine persists down the water column, but with the aliphatics, we don't see that at all. So the bromination of the aliphatics that occurs seems to be just one more step in the long road towards eventual decomposition and mineralization of that organic carbon. Um, we need to do a lot more experiments to figure that out. And that's one thing that uh, I'm working on with, with Lena Yu. So we are looking at millennial scale. This isn't marine stuff anymore, but we want to see if we're stabilizing uh, terrestrial organic matter by looking at very old uh, peat samples. So we can really go dip back 8,000 years and kind of measure um, the, the organohalogen and uh, organohalogen organic carbon ratio in these to see whether the halogenated organics are a relatively stable form of carbon or if, you know, to some extent, it's just another step in the long road of mineralization. Mm -hmm. So, I don't uh, how, are the, how are the concentrations for the bromine and chlorine in the peats? They're high. So I haven't measured any of those, but the reason we chose peats is because other people have measured really high concentrations of uh, organochlorine and organobromine in peats. So peats are just soils where the organic matter accumulates faster than it decomposes, and it's the perfect set of conditions to have organohalogens forming. Um, so it's not, you don't have as much background halide as with marine samples, but you're probably looking at, you know, the people who've measured this are not looking at it the way we're looking at where we're, looking, we're actually getting totals, right? So I don't think there's any measurements yet of the totals, uh, the way that we're measuring it, but I would imagine it's on the order of a couple of hundred parts per million. Okay. Stay tuned. Okay. Uh, Yang Ha, you had a question. Thank you for waiting. Sorry, Yang Ha. No problem. So uh, your talk reminds me back to my sophomore chemistry that uh, bromine has better selectivity than chlorine. So that's why you, you pay an extra amount of money when, when you, when you want to buy bromine-related uh, reagent. So does that conclusion has to do with your findings here? Yeah, that's a great point. So that's a classic, I teach organic chemistry, so that's a classic part of a uh, studying radical reactions in organic chemistry, which is that radical bromination is more selective than radical chlorination. That's what you're talking about? Uh, yes. Yeah, so that that could be really interesting. So a lot of these fenton type of reactions might occur through a radical chlorination or radical bromination mechanism. Yeah, and cool. yeah, exactly. So we're seeing a lot of these aliphatic organochlorines being produced in the chlorination reactions, but not so much in the bromination reactions. So one of my hypotheses, I actually talk about it in the paper, is that it could be if there is a radical mechanism that could be behind uh, 
maybe a greater diversity of aliphatic organochlorines that we see compared with the aliphatic organobromines. And I think it pertains more to the aliphatics than the aromatics because the aromatics are more likely to, not so likely to be produced through radical mechanisms. They're more likely to be produced through uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. That's, so that's a great, great observation. Really astute. Um, I think that's why we could be seeing the greater diversity here if it goes through a radical mechanism. Okay, um, uh, thank you. Uh, Satish, you had a question? Yeah, um, I think yeah, actually Elia already answered it in the last couple of minutes. Uh, it's related to the mechanisms that uh, are the differences in pollination versus pollination, and I think um, yeah, that's what uh, Ali was saying. Uh, great talk, Ali. I have uh, another question. Um, it's related to the quantification of these uh, halogens, it's, you know, especially the lighter one, like say chloride, or even other ones like say you know, halogens, like sulfur, phosphorus, and so on. So, uh, I mean, it's not only for Ali, the question is for everyone here. So, when we try to take these samples and uh, shine x rays and do another thing, so the penetration depths are so low at these low energies. So when we dry the samples for X-ray analysis, especially like XRF and so on, so the moving water, the drying water, is actually mobilizing all the salts on the surface and precipitating them out. So this is actually a problem for us when we do the chlorine analysis and not so much with bromine. So I'm wondering whether Ali or anyone else have a comment on that. Sure, I can, I can talk about that if no one. So I had so much trouble. Can I stop sharing my screen so I can see you all? Um, Cause I just want to see people. Satish, can you, can you mute yourself? Cause I think you've got some background. I don't know if I can mute Satish. Okay, better. All right. So, uh, I had so much, if I am and understanding your question correctly, Satish, I uh, had so much trouble. So I'm showing you the nice data that came after a lot of troubleshooting, of course. And the major problem that we had was residual halides. And I developed a procedure for rinsing that, you know, we're dealing with 0.5 molar chloride in these seawater samples. And, you know, we're doing all of the reactions that we're doing in artificial seawater. So, I have a rinsing procedure where we do, uh, we use a refrigerated centrifuge and we do at least six, if not more successive, rinse with 50 milliliters of deionized water, vortex, centrifuge, and then repeat that again with 50 more milliliters, five or more times. So that was effective in removing any trace of halides from particulate samples. And you have to make sure that they're very pulverized samples because the surface area is really important. And again, you know, we lysed the phytoplankton membrane so that there wouldn't be intact cells because if you'd have intact cells, you have halides in the, in the cellular solution. So those lysed membranes were pretty easy to rinse because uh, we didn't have any intact cells anymore. So does that answer your question? I mean, it's not, not just the chlorine or, you know, I'm just talking about in general, the light elements. So this is actually a problem because when we dry the samples, as the water is, you know, during drying process, the water is coming through the pores and then it's mobilizing all the salts and precipitating on the surface. So when the penetration depths are of the order of like a micron, a few microns at the low energies, so you are actually looking at the things that are precipitating on the surface rather than on the wall. So this is the general problem we face, like, you know, whenever we try to do like um, aggregates or, you know, materials with water, pores and water and so on. So that's why I'm just curious so whether the, anyone has a suggestion, so. So, all right, okay. So we approached it through salt removal, but I don't know if anyone else has a ideas. All right, let's move to uh, what will be the last question. Anna, you had a question? 
Uh, yeah, um, Alessandra, first of all, thank you very much for this impressive presentation. Um, this was very surprising to me to hear that uh, CVs are not as good for health as it's widely believed. Uh, so I'm wondering if you're aware of any statistics, perhaps uh, of like, you know, increased uh, chlorine and bromine caused illnesses uh, in maybe groups of people's nationalities that, you know, consume CVs daily. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your question. It's a great question. I, we don't know anything about the toxicity of these natural organohalogens. And, you know, if you think about major seaweed eating cultures, like in Japan, they have some of the highest uh, longevity of any culture. So I'm not so sure that they are toxic, but we don't have any any data on the toxicity of the natural organohalogens. <laughs> However, you can see that a lot of seaweed eating cultures, uh, you know, have a uh, have relatively decent health uh, health outcomes. So, so I'm not so sure they're toxic. Yeah, I would think uh, that the PBDE is a whole is a, a chemically different than uh, perhaps some natural stuff. So, uh, you know, just because it has a halogen attached doesn't necessarily mean it's toxic. Yeah, exactly. And there are naturally produced PBDE analogs, but we're probably looking at a whole host of things. Of course, we can't tell with zanes, but we might be looking at, you know, brominated tyrosines and tryptophans and stuff like that. So hard to say. Right. It seems to me that with a lot of these natural things, about, you know, we, would have, uh, we would have evolved defense mechanisms for it, as opposed to purely artificial chemicals, which are novel. Right. 